If a government can't provide the core basic services, it's failed in its mission. After an injury ended his 14-year career as a police officer, Pete Constant decided to bring some law and order to local government and ran for city council where he sat as a member for eight years and became a proponent of pension reform. The result was Measure B, which restructured the retirement benefits of San Jose City employees and was passed by a large majority in one of the most liberal regions in the state. Pete recently sat down with Reason TV to talk about the fight to save his city from financial disaster and what other localities can do to adopt reform. Our city had been in many years of budget deficits and there were many years coming in the future and I just thought that the financial decisions had been terribly made. And so I really wanted to focus on that and pensions were a part of it but not the driving factor. It was once I got into office and I start asking questions and learning more and serving on one of the pension funds initially and then ultimately both of them and getting trained in them and finding out what was really under the surface and this huge problem that people were not even aware of, let alone talking about. How did it get to the point where it was just so bad? In a 10 year period from the year 2001 to the year um, 2011, the city's responsibility for pension contributions went from approximately 72 to $74 million a year to $245 million a year. So a quarter of our operating budget was going just to make pension contributions. So we had really one area to look at. Here's the problem. And then it was, how do we find out within this circle of pension, what are the driving factors in there? And to do that, we had to do a lot of investigation, a lot of education. I had to learn a lot about pensions. What were some of the residents going through in your area when you had these costs like this just mounting up? Well, in San Jose, it had gotten so bad that it was evident to almost every single resident. We had built a brand new police station, over a hundred million dollars brand new police station with a fence around it because we could not afford to move people into it. We had four brand new libraries throughout the city that were the same. They were built, ready to go, had all the equipment, books in them, but they had a fence around them because we couldn't afford to put employees in them. We couldn't afford to maintain the roads anymore because we had to continually cut back. We went from a workforce of over 7,500 employees to just about, just over 5,000 employees. So a severe reduction of uh, people to provide services to the residents. So it was impossible for a resident to go through their normal everyday life and not feel the impact of the cuts that we had to make. What did you guys do in the city to kind of help scale back some of these costs? Well, I think it's important to know that we did more than just our one pension reform vote that most people know us for. It was a multi-year process. We started off with um, some big things that were simpler, like changing the governance structure of our pension board, uh, making sure that we had more people who had no conflicts of interest serving and some expertise serving on our pension board so we could get better decisions being made. We also had provisions in our charter that had minimum pension benefits written into the city charter, which a charter for a city is like the Constitution. You have to follow it. So first we went to the voters and said, we have a problem, we want to find a solution, but we can't do it because of this charter provision. Work with us, approve taking these minimums out of the charter so that we can negotiate and come up with a change in our pensions and we'll bring that back to you for approval. What that did is that gave us multiple bites at the apple, multiple times to engage with the public, talk to them about what we were doing, highlight the issues that we had. We completely changed our budget process so that as we talked about balancing our budget, we had discussions about the driving factors and we were able to connect the dots between these rising costs and these cut services so that the residents could see and understand in, in simple language what was happening. You know, as far as the public looking at this and dealing with the unions and other groups, did you feel like they both were on the same page there? It was a mixed bag, to be honest. There were a lot of people in the community that just didn't know. They didn't know we had this problem. They didn't understand the whole pension concept because it's a pretty complicated system that public agencies have. So we had to do a lot of education. But once we were able to bring it down to an understandable level and break it down into component parts and talk to people um, and make comparisons to what's from what's happening in the financial numbers to what's happening in everyday life, the people really began to get it. 
with the employee unions, it was very difficult. The discussions at first, we put together a task force and it was a structural budget deficit elimination task force. And we had people sit around the table to engage people in discussions. And we had our union leaders sit there with their arms folded and not willing to have a discussion. One of the union leaders had an op-ed piece uh, printed in the Mercury News that basically said, we don't have a problem. It was a stick your head in the sand. Let's just wait for this problem to go away. Because uh, you'd hear many times, well, the Dow's going to recover and our problem will go away. But we all know that the Dow recovered and our problem hasn't gone away. In fact, it's bigger than it was uh, before. So we had a lot of contention with our employee unions, but we sat, we created another task force, we had more meetings, we went through the meet and confer process, we went through the Seal Beach negotiations, we had a number of discussions. We never ultimately were able to get to a point where they agreed with us. Um, very contentious, we had picketing going on, we had uh, all kinds of protests and things like that to draw attention to what they felt was unfair treatment or scapegoating, that we were blaming the problem on the employees, um, which we weren't doing. What we were actually trying to do, and we try to remind them, is we're trying to protect you, especially in your retirement years, make sure you have this benefit that, by the way, you've been paying into just like we have. And uh, so we never really got to a resolution with the unions, but we knew we had a problem that we had to carry forward. So we took it to the voters made our case with the voters, and the voters resoundingly agreed with us that this was something that we had to deal with. How would you say reform is working? In just implementing the new tier for new employees, the city is already saving over $20 million per year for two consecutive years. So we've realized over $40 million in savings. Now that pales in comparison to the 65 or more million per year that we will save once we are able to completely implement. But those $20 million each year have gone a long way towards restoring services. So we've been able to open every one of those closed libraries. We've been able to start repairing our streets. We've been able to do a number of things that we weren't able to do just two short years ago. What do you say to critics of, of your plan that are maybe looking to you guys as a reason to not do reform? I think it's important that we point out what's fact from fiction. Uh, you will hear repeated over and over about the out-of-control crime rate in San Jose when in fact our crime rate is down. Our violent crime and homicides in particular are down in San Jose. And it's just not the city council saying that. You can look at the police department, either their raw statistics or the statistics that they report to the FBI. Our crime is going down and has been going down. Uh, so so where is the misinformation coming from? Well, people who are against pension reform will create whatever stories they need to help their case. And we just did a survey of a number of residents and even though crime is going down in San Jose, the perception of crime is going up. And I think that's mm -hmm. by a number of reasons. One is it has been repeated so often by the police officers, the firefighters and the union leaders that people believe it because they trust these people. These are people who hold positions of trust in our community and they are saying it and the residents have no reason not to believe it. So it's our job as a city to correct those facts as we go on. So as more counties and cities are looking at reform, what are some of the takeaways from your experience in San Jose that you can tell other reformers? Well, I think the first thing is the elected officials in these cities and counties have to educate themselves. Many of them don't even know what their pension system consists of, let alone what obligations they have. And in order to get the right answers, you need to know what questions to ask. And many elected officials just don't have the expertise nor the time to gain the expertise to ask those questions. So I would say if, if you're not sure you have a problem or if you know you have a problem, you need to reach out to people who have dealt with this to talk to them so that you can find out what questions you need to ask. Then avail yourself to a number of the resources out there, like the resources in the Pension Reform Toolkit that Reason has, to look at how you can address the issue. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to this because there are so many different varieties of pension plans, so many different pension benefits that you've got to find out what's going to work for your community. Click below to see more from Reason TV and subscribe for all of our latest videos.